Oh. Come on in, Teddy. How are we all, Sergeant? Here's a great scene with uh, actor Edmund O'Brien uh, playing uh, Raymond Tubby Barton, who was uh, the division commander for the 4th Infantry Division. And uh, O'Brien looks a lot like Barton, um, although Barton had a mustache. It would have been a nice little touch to have a, a, a mustache on uh, O'Brien. Do you have to put it in writing? I knew you wouldn't let me go unless I did. You're putting me on a spot, Teddy, and you know it. I didn't mean to, Tubby. Oh, the hell you did. And, uh, of course, too, uh, we have the wonderful Henry Fonda uh, as uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., who's the assistant division commander for the 4th. Uh, Roosevelt, son of uh, the former president of the same name, uh, was arthritic. He had been having chest pains that he wasn't telling people about. Uh, and as we see in this uh, conversation between these two characters, uh, he most definitely was not physically fit uh, to be participating in the invasion in the capacity that he did. Uh, Roosevelt had previously uh, been with the 1st Infantry Division in North Africa, and he had essentially made enemies with George Patton. Uh, George Patton did not care for his um, kind of uh, uh, humble, informal demeanor. Patton wanted a spit and polish general uh, leading this outfit. Uh, Omar Bradley, too, thought that, uh, you know, he was, uh, that Roosevelt was too casual uh, in his command style. And so um, he got booted, essentially, from the 1st Division. Um, and got the number two job here uh, with the 4th Division. And uh, it would be the 4th Division's responsibility to land at Utah Beach, uh, the westernmost of these allied beachheads. Aber ich kann doch nicht wegen dieser Wirren sich völlig widersprechenden Meldungen den Führer wecken. Er war bis 4 Uhr auf, dann hat er ein Schlafmittel genommen und sich zurückgezogen. Ach, uh, this uh, frustration among German generals about uh, the Fuhrer is not to be awakened uh, was, was very much true. Uh, Hitler had taken some sleeping pills. Uh, he often slept late into the day. And of course, uh, Hitler was, was popping pills like crazy uh, at this point in the war. And uh, apparently nobody dared to knock on his door uh, to tell him uh, that the Second Front was opening. Uh, that the Allies were uh, arriving. And, uh, you know, it, it's led to one of the big what-if questions, you know, how many more troops would have been mobilized had uh, Hitler the, the wherewithal and the consciousness uh, to do so. Um, but these are just mind games after all. And here in my mind is uh, the iconic facial expression <laughs> of the movie. The invasion has come. Verdammt, warum hauen Sie nach, wenn Sie mir schon nicht glauben? Dann kommen Sie doch her und sehen Sie sich selber an! Das ist fantastisch. Das ist unglaublich. And uh, the majority, the vast majority of these 5,000 plus ships that uh, Major Pluscott is uh, uh, freaking out over uh, were uh, British ships. Um, and that is something that is uh, often overlooked or not taken into consideration in these uh, somewhat American-centric uh, perspectives of the war. Um, but uh, the, the invasion could not have been undertaken without the British Navy. Uh, that was one of the core ingredients. And it's so interesting to reflect upon these scenes with Omar Bradley. He's uh, arguably one of the most important characters in the film, and yet his character does not speak at all. I mean, he's this uh, silent, stoical figure uh, standing on the bridge, uh, seemingly, you know, all-knowing, uh, watching this, this huge drama unfold before him. And uh, it's, it's almost unfortunate to an extent that, that he has not given a voice uh, among these characters. Um, of course, Omar Bradley was still alive uh, at this time. 
Uh, he undoubtedly saw this movie, and uh, just a few years down the road, he would serve as a technical advisor for the 1970 movie in which he's played by Carl Malden, the movie Patton. A fun nugget here we see uh, Goldfinger, a future James Bond villain, uh, playing a far less glamorous uh, German milkman. The moment with uh, the, the French farmer by the coast here who uh, retrieves his, his tricolor flag after these four years of occupation, I, I just love it. There's, there's a moment during the bombardment here um, where it, it seems like he can't make up his mind whether he wants to laugh or cry. And that was a very real emotion among these French citizens along the coast. And I think the best way that I can sum up their reaction is that it was one of fearful jubilation. That they were incredibly pleased that the Allies had arrived, that their moment of liberation was likely at hand, uh, but yet there were these very lethal possibilities uh, that surrounded them, uh, being killed uh, by your own side uh, during these bombardments. And um, if memory serves correctly, I believe that there were about uh, 50,000 French citizens killed around the time of the invasion um, during uh, predominantly during a, a lot of the aerial bombardments that bookended the invasion or, or took place uh, on June 6th itself. And so uh, the French paid an incredibly high price uh, for their liberation. Uh, but if, if they had the ability and the sheer luck to survive it, um, it was a very jubilant time indeed. Not only were French people jubilant of the invasion, but uh, people back home in, in the United States were, were reacting to it in a very enthusiastic way as well. And you know, um, there was some uncertainty about how people should react to the Normandy invasion. Should it be celebrated? Should it be mourned? Should it be commemorated? Should it be solemn? Should it be celebratory? And inevitably, the, the answer was all of the above, depending on what American town you were living in uh, at the time. But I think the emotion of D-Day, domestically speaking, can be best conveyed through this original newspaper uh, that I have here. Oh, this again, so I won't get the glare. Here we go. Um, so this is from the San Francisco Chronicle. And look at that font size. <laughs> I've never seen a font size bigger on a newspaper. Uh, and indeed, this was a headline grabber. It was meant to get people's attention, and surely enough, it did. And in the days before the internet, before things could go viral, people depended on newspapers predominantly to be informed. Uh, and so, we can look at really cool artifacts like this uh, with these very kind of vague and broad reports of what is going on overseas. Uh, and it's just really compelling stuff. One of the primary problems with this uh, naval as well as aerial bombardment preceding the amphibious assaults is that uh, much like uh, Pickett's Charge at, at Gettysburg eight decades earlier, um, is that a lot of these rounds, uh, you know, a lot of these guns overshot their targets and it did not have the, the full effectiveness that was uh, originally hoped and oftentimes was uh, the perils of having high hopes in these massive bombardments. A lot of these uh, bunkers uh, that, that we see in these scenes, uh, the, the originals that is, they, they still exist uh, today. And uh, some of them are formal historic sites that you can pay admission to go see and tour. 
Uh, the Crisbeck battery near Utah Beach is a, a very interesting one. And uh, that is possibly one of the points uh, from where uh, the Allied ships were first spotted by German defenders. Um, but then there are other uh, bunkers and concrete complexes uh, that are more subdued and kind of hidden. Um, in fact, I, I saw one when I was there that was uh, even someone's garage. Uh, that they turned it into uh, a house for their automobiles uh, by the beach. Um, and so uh, some of them are more concealed than others. And here the movie goes a little bit out of chronological order. Uh, the, the first U.S. amphibious troops to land uh, were in fact on uh, Utah Beach and not Omaha Beach, but given the, the dramatic uh, scale and bloodshed of Omaha, uh, it, it's understandable on the part of the filmmakers uh, that this is the beachhead that they started off with. And, uh, you know, something else too is that a lot of these landing craft had to start 10 miles out. Um, and these poor guys, you know, had, they had to get up at 2 or 3 a.m. They had a large, greasy breakfast that a lot of them ended up losing uh, along their journeys. And uh, it, it was a, a miserable trek, a final trek for some of them, uh, moving those several miles toward the beach. As so we can see here, uh, a lot of these landing craft are a lot bigger than the uh, perhaps more typical Higgins boats uh, that could hold about uh, 30 men. And uh, these ones uh, provided by the Navy in the early 60s here were uh, a little bit more spacious. There it is, man. Omaha Beach, dead ahead. Something that I really appreciate, though, about these Omaha Beach scenes uh, is the scale. And I think The Longest Day succeeds in a way that Saving Private Ryan does not. Um, Saving Private Ryan offers a, an up-close perspective like you're in the midst of combat. Um, these scenes are more, uh, they're, they're mounted in a more grand way. And uh, that's okay, you know, it doesn't have the, the violence and the gore and the bloodshed uh, like we see in that movie of, you know, 35 years later. Um, but these scenes, they work. And it's because you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, well, active duty service members who also happen to be the, the right age and have the right physique um, of GIs. And um, it, it, it's just very impressive. And this is one of my favorite shots in the movie as far as cinematography goes, where we have this uh, long track shot uh, following the men of the 29th Division as they rush up the beach, even if you can see the silhouette of the camera following them um, as they move up. Um, it, it just captures a, a lot of the, the, the drama and the chaos of the moment. And at the tail end of that shot, you, you see a, a very brief moment of handheld camera work. And in many ways, that sort of cinematography foreshadows what cinematographer Janusz Kaminski will do in 1997 as they're filming Saving Private Ryan. This idea of using handheld camera work to uh, film recreated combat uh, was further perfected two years later with the Stanley Kubrick film, Dr. Strangelove. Check out that movie, some really impressive black and white combat cinematography that looks like newsreel footage. And we kind of get a glimpse of this transitory moment in Hollywood history where filmmakers are starting to experiment a little bit more, cameras are starting to become a little bit less cumbersome, uh, and you get a sense of that in these beach scenes in The Longest Day.
Such great cinematography. Jeffrey Hunter waving the big fireball behind him. Really well conducted. In some of these scenes, though, you, you do see modernity uh, rearing its head every now and again. Um, you see some very 1960s glasses amongst these uh, waterlogged troops as they're working their way amongst the obstacles. And, uh, you know, these things perhaps couldn't have been avoided in 1961. And in these opening shots at Utah Beach, um, you can see how Henry Fonda almost dies. You know, he fumbles in the water and he's almost run over by the landing craft. Um, he's really lucky he didn't get scalped here. Um, but as we see in, uh, in these scenes, uh, the fighting at Utah Beach, despite the fact that the division sustained about 200 casualties, um, things were mopped up very quickly in comparison to the carnage on Omaha Beach. Um, in a short amount of time, uh, these men had, had pushed up to the sand dunes, and uh, despite the comparatively small casualties they sustained on the sands, a lot of bloodshed awaited them in the battles to come. This division would sustain about 250% casualties throughout the war. And uh, one of Theodore Roosevelt's uh, aides, a guy by the name of Stevie Stevenson, um, actually uh, remarked how uh, Roosevelt was actually wounded on, on Utah Beach. He got a piece of shrapnel um, in his thumb. And uh, the general just kind of oh, waved it off and, and laughed it off. And indeed, he had the, the same sort of bravado, um, perhaps as his father did, as he was charging up San Juan Hill all those years earlier. Over there. Okay. Hang on to that map case, Eddie. And uh, unfortunately, um, among those casualties of the 4th Infantry Division as they continued their fight into Normandy was uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. himself, uh, who suffered a fatal heart attack just a, a little bit over a month uh, after landing on, on Utah Beach. I mean, this was a guy who, who led from the front. He ultimately received the Medal of Honor posthumously. Uh, because of his actions on June 6th. Uh, and uh, indeed, he would be one of many, many casualties in that outfit. As best as I can figure it, this is the wrong beach. The land is about a mile and a quarter south of where we were supposed to land. As Henry Fonda indicates to uh, his, his fellow officers here, uh, the division landed approximately a half mile off course, but uh, luckily this worked to their favor because they landed in a, a lighter defended section of Utah Beach. And they ultimately landed just a, a short distance away from the community of uh, San Marie Dumont. And uh, it would be there in the coming hours uh, that the 4th Division would link up with elements of the 101st Airborne. Okay, let's go! And uh, this is essentially the only time this division has uh, been depicted in a World War II movie. And as we'll be discussing later on, that's something that my brother and I hope to rectify in the future. Some uh, more great cinematography here in this uh, iconic strafing scene of uh, the gold sword in Juno beachheads. Um, but I also have a, a bit of a complaint with this scene as well. Because this is the only time in this whole movie dedicated to D-Day that the Canadian landing zones are even acknowledged. There are no Canadian characters in this movie. None of them are depicted, and they only get this like very brief, somewhat obligatory, literal sweepover um, here in this one scene. And I think this is one of the great injustices of The Longest Day, uh, where it completely ignores 
one of the nations that participated in a really big way. If you're interested in learning more about the Canadian experience on uh, D-Day, there's a, a fairly good uh, docudrama uh, called Storming Juno. Um, it's, it's not as grand uh, as, as The Longest Day is, uh, but it's certainly better than nothing. So check it out sometime. Storming Juno. Any minute now, stand by. Let's give it them back for Dunkirk. Did you hear that? But Jesus, Dunkirk. Did you hear it, Clark? And uh, indeed, um, many of the British considered D-Day to be Dunkirk in reverse. They were back. Oh, the evil of it all. Trying to dawn a man before he's even had a chance to fight. Ah, cop. And here we see a young Sean Connery on the verge of megastardom. And uh, he had to wrap up these scenes uh, rather quickly. Uh, because he was uh, doing the Caribbean uh, to film Dr. No, his big debut as James Bond. There was indeed a bagpiper with uh, Lovett's Commandos. His name was uh, Bill Millen. He was a, a young lad um, in his uh, early 20s who was uh, actually uh, originally from Saskatchewan. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess he's uh, the um, token Canadian um, in the movie, but uh, he, he definitely had uh, uh, Scottish heritage in him, shall we say. Keep those vehicles moving. MP, chase up those cyclists. Get off the beach. And uh, in the form of uh, Kenneth Moore here, we have another very colorful character uh, from the British Navy, whose name was Colin Maud, uh, who was uh, the beach master uh, in this sector. Uh, and indeed, he did have a dog with him. But the dog, uh, whose name was Winnie, short for Winston, in honor of, of Winston Churchill, of course, uh, was in fact a German shepherd. Uh, he was not the bulldog. Uh, as, as we see here. And uh, this was a decision purposely made by Daryl F. Zanuck um, because uh, he thought, well, Major Pluskat's character has a German Shepherd. We can't have two German Shepherds in the movie. Um, so I'm going to give Maud the Bulldog instead. And uh, the really wonderful thing about this scene uh, with, with Maud uh, is that Kenneth Moore has... Uh, Maud's actual shillelagh, uh, his actual walking stick that he had on D-Day. And uh, the real life Maud was still alive at this time, and he loaned uh, that to Moore uh, for the making of this film. And so uh, uh, here and there throughout, um, there's some really cool D-Day artifacts kind of being resurrected here for the sake of the big screen. I was told I'd be able to put through a short news flash on your radio. My dear fellow, I don't want to appear uncooperative. Look, uh, yes, yes, uh, I know all about the power of the press. Um, this interaction that, that Maud has with an, an American reporter, a version of that uh, did occur. Um, in reality, though, the, the interaction was even more comedic um, because um, this American reporter, he was walking toward Maud. And Maud kept shaking his stick at him, saying, don't you move. And then, you know, the American reporter tried walking a little bit more. And Maud said, don't you move. And uh, here the reporter had walked into a minefield. And it's a good thing that he listened to Maud after all. Here, clip this off. On the wrong way. Not talk the Germans, you idiot! Uh, I, I love this scene with... Uh, with the pigeons. Um, there were carrier pigeons used um, throughout the Second World War and in some cases here during uh, the Normandy invasion, but uh, perhaps they were not always quite as efficient as what their operators hoped they would be. And uh, it leads to uh, perhaps my favorite line in the movie. Damn traitors! Hold it. Damn traitors. <laughs> I love it. Uh, sure, no, that's what I call a hell of a man. Aye, oh, I like his dog, too. 
Don't stand there yapping! And I just love it that Sean Connery offers the little bit of comedic relief that can be found in this movie. It kind of goes against character when you think about it. Thank you. All right, boys, everything's going according to plan. Stand by to move. Millen, Blue Bonnet. And Blue Bonnet was actually one of uh, the songs that Millen played on his bagpipes. You mean to tell me that's all we gotta climb? I don't know why the Air Force or Navy can't do this job. Here in these scenes with uh, the Rangers who are about to storm Point du Hoc, um, it's quite an impressive lineup of, of actors. You have Robert Wagner, you have uh, George Seagal who's, who's uh, about to hit it big, um, you have uh, teen heartthrob Fabian, uh, you have uh, singer Paul Anka uh, who uh, also uh, wrote and performed the theme song for the movie that, that, that plays during uh, the end credits. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, impressive acting talent um, in these scenes, even if the historical scenes themselves are something to be desired. Um, this scene at Point du Hoc was uh, filmed at the actual place. They apparently did not have historical preservation uh, in mind with all these squibs and explosives going off. Uh, but you know, the, the point to Hawk scenes here, they, they just didn't really play out like this. Um, you know, there's the, this iconic, uh, you know, recreation where they're, they're shooting up the rope uh, from the beach. Uh, in reality, they, they shot those ropes, waterlogged ropes that often didn't reach their targets. Um, from mortars that were located at the front of these uh, British operated landing craft. Um, and so, you know, the Rangers really had to, to improvise um, in, in a lot of cases. And so, um, in these scenes here, you know, it's, it's just greatly condensed. You know, you certainly get. Uh, an appreciation for the, the size and, and the scale um, of the operation, but it just didn't quite play out like this. I, uh, I had the pleasure of, of knowing uh, two rangers from this battalion uh, who were actually uh, from my hometown and uh, most recently, um, the last of them uh, passed away not too long ago, and his name was Sheldon Bear, and he was uh, actually uh, wounded on, on Point Du Hoc. And uh, I went to visit him uh, at, at his veterans hospital one day, and uh, I'll never forget this, he, he uh, lifted down his nightshirt a little bit and he, he showed me the spot where he was wounded. On, on June 6, 1944. Uh, incredible guy, uh, as were all of these rangers. Uh, <laughs> built like brick houses, uh, tough as nails, and uh, their accomplishments at, at Point Du Hawk and beyond uh, really speak to that. And apparently a handful of uh, uh, the extras involved in this scene were actual rangers themselves, uh, one or two of them uh, being uh, veterans of Point Du Hoc. So there's a, a little bit of authenticity at least. You mean we come up all this way for nothing? And uh, th this uh, uh, final um, kind of uh, tableau here at, at Point Du Hoc where Fabian is in this remorseful state. He says, we come up all this way for nothing. Um, and that's, that's not the case at all. Um, that's one of the great historical errors of, of this film and also the, the book itself. Uh, because it is true that these uh, large artillery pieces were not located at Point Du Hoc. Um, that they were located uh, perhaps a mile inland. Um, and uh, two of the American Rangers, uh, Len Lamel 
and uh, Jack Kuhn, another guy from my hometown, later became my city police chief. Uh, these two guys went off on uh, some reconnaissance and uh, in one of the, the hedgerows further back from Point Du Hoc, they found five 155 millimeter German guns and right under the noses of, of a company of Germans, uh, they uh, dismantled those guns with thermite grenades. Uh, these, these explosives that would be largely silent, they would turn white hot and uh, they essentially you know, melted all the machinery uh, in those artillery pieces. Um, and so, uh, certainly the fighting at Point Du Hoc was not for naught. Uh, and uh, really the movie, you know, uh, quits that part of the story only halfway through. And uh, so uh, certainly um, this is a tale that is worthy of a movie in and of itself. Uh, because the fighting at Point Du Hoc went on for essentially over a day. And uh, like the British paratroopers at Pegasus Bridge, uh, these American rangers uh, thwarted counterattack after counterattack. Uh, and so things became very desperate there, but uh, much like Major Howard's men, they held until relieved. Sarge, you're going to be all right. Medic! Medic! Oh, and here we have with uh, the Germans trying to surrender a little bit of our foreshadowing that is thematically replicated in Saving Private Ryan, where these guys try to unsuccessfully surrender. Sir? Well? Mr. Smith says to tell you he stood his men too, and the Jerrys are moving up into the wood. One of the fantastic things about these... Uh, Con Canal moments uh, is that Major Howard and Lord Lovett actually came to visit the set and uh, there, there's a, a pretty great photograph of the two of them uh, meeting with their respective characters um, and so uh, having having your, your, your true life personas uh, there to, to offer insight must have been uh, an incredible experience for some of these actors all the Panzer divisions except the 21st seem to be sitting it out in the rear. Sir. This big map that we see at Southwick House uh, exists to this very day. Uh, you can uh, visit that place that was uh, Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. And uh, th this uh, scene here, um, you know, it was essentially the equivalent of mission control. You know, they didn't have big computers or, or jumbo screens or anything like that. Everything was, was manual, uh, but it exists to this day, and it's a, an incredible, tangible item uh, that survives all of these years later. I, I love this scene as well. Uh, this one continuous shot uh, that, that lasts about two minutes, I believe, of the, the French commandos uh, storming the German positions at Wiestrom. And uh, this was uh, filmed in a helicopter. On occasion, you can see some of the ripples in the water created from that. This was really cutting-edge filming in the early 1960s. The idea of having a, a continuous shot uh, was something uh, very fresh at that time. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's reached a heightened state of perfection with movies like 1917, which we have also analyzed. Um, but I just love this shot. Once again, it, it captures a, a sense of, of scale. These scenes were uh, not actually filmed in Wiestrom. Uh, they were uh, shot at Port Enbessin, uh, which was another community um, along the Normandy coast. And uh, there was, in fact, a casino uh, located in that town, but it looked nothing like uh, the one that, that we see here with uh, Germans scrambling on uh, its rooftop. Um, if you visit Port Enbessin today, um, I am told um, that you can still see uh, Wiestrom painted 
on the side of, of some of the buildings as uh, a relic of, of the filming of The Longest Day. Probably confuses the American guest. Allez, vous en! Non! Non, partez! The scene with uh, the Catholic nuns coming down from the convent uh, is, is uh, a very compelling bit of cinema to uh, pluck at the heartstrings. Uh, but unfortunately, it did not happen. Uh, there, there was no convent in, in Weestrom, as far as I know. And uh, it is likely fabrication on the part of the filmmakers. It's a good cinematic touch, though even if it's historically apocryphal. In land. What about the first division? They're hung up, sir. Like we are. Another outfit that does not get its due in this movie is the first infantry division. Uh, they only get this brief shout out that we see here. And uh, this is something that will try to be rectified by a veteran of the first infantry division by the name of Samuel Fuller, um, who about 20 years after this, uh, we'll make a movie entitled The Big Red One, starring Lee Marvin and Mark Hamill. Uh, a very different sort of, uh, uh, shall we say, artistic film, a psychological film about the GI experience, um, but is nonetheless worth a view if you've never seen it. Hell no, we're not leaving. We're going to get up that hill. Find me somebody who can speak for the Rangers. Yes, sir. Now look, back down the beach on the right. Norman Coda really took this hands-on approach to, to rallying the huddled masses uh, on, on Omaha Beach. And uh, when, when he encountered some, uh, some, some rangers who were on Omaha Beach, um, among his, his many famous words to them, you know, um, God damn it, if, if you're rangers, then lead the way. And of course, you know, rangers lead the way has, uh, has become uh, the mantra of uh, such troops uh, in the years since. Uh, a little bit after uh, D-Day, one, one of the great stories about Coda, uh, who, who took uh, command of the 28th Infantry Division not long after, um, is that he he encountered some, uh, some, some inexperienced troops who were presumably in combat for the first time and they were unsure how to clear a farmhouse that, that had German defenders in it. And uh, as the story goes, as the legend goes, uh, Coda uh, got a grenade off one of them, ran up to the house himself, uh, hurled it through the window. The grenade went off presumably killing all of the defenders, and he uh, rather nonchalantly walked back to the troops and he said, that's how you clear a farmhouse. I don't have to tell you the story, you all know it. Only two kinds of people are gonna stay on this beach. Those that are already dead and those that are gonna die. Now it's uh, some great lines, some, some, uh, some forceful words of motivation. And the only problem is, is that Norman Coda did not say these words. Uh, this quote was actually appropriated from Colonel George Taylor, uh, who was an officer in the 1st Infantry Division. And uh, these words about only two types of men are going to stay on this beach uh, were actually uttered by him. And uh, this is something that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is later on corrected by Samuel Fuller in uh, his cinematic interpretation of the Big Red One on Omaha Beach. Now get off your butts! You guys are the fight, 29! Unfortunately, Coda's luck did not last th throughout the duration of the war uh, because he ended up commanding the 28th Infantry Division in the bloodbath and stalemate uh, that would be the Hurtgen Forest, uh, where he was uh, accused by some of his detractors for um, mismanaging his men and sending them in pell-mell and uh, being disconnected from the front uh, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, whereas uh, Normandy was his bright and shining moment, there were certainly dark days ahead for him. Am I glad to see you? Those bodies. Get those bodies down. This is one of the best moments in the film, and uh, I can almost forgive John Wayne being too old 
and out of shape. But the face that his character makes as he sees these corpses dangling from the tree limbs, uh, it, it's one of the, the best emotional expressions in the movie, undoubtedly. I got a rifle, sir. Well, good for you, son. The Rangers are ready, General. As the Rangers are moving up here on Omaha Beach, you'll notice um, that there is an, an overturned Jeep uh, in the middle of, of a lot of these scenes. And uh, just to play history police here for a minute, um, there is a widely spread photograph on the interwebs that claims to be a color photograph from D-Day. And you see, you know, troops dug in these, these shallow foxholes and, you know, stuff's on fire and, and so on and so forth. Um, but in actuality, that is a photo from the set of The Longest Day. And the red flag that tells you that is that same overturned Jeep is in the middle of that photograph. Um, and so, uh, I've actually emailed, you know, uh, some websites, historical and news websites, saying, yeah, that's not a D-Day photograph, that's actually from a movie set 18 years after the fact. Um, so if you ever see that photograph, uh, know that it is not of D-Day. The, the, the moment when the, the fictionalized John Fuller gets it in the back, it's just uh, heartbreaking stuff. And, you know, and, and it, it speaks to the, the desperation. You know, it just when you think you're on, on the verge of making it, you know, on the verge of making a breakthrough. And uh, not everyone made it. Once again, uh, they just, uh, it, it captures the, the scale of it all so well. You have these hundreds of guys uh, pouring through the breach. You, you just don't see stuff like this today in filmmaking. Actor Eddie Albert has, has quite the iconic death scene in this movie too. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, the real life Eddie Albert um, who w would gain fame on the television show Green Acres in the 1960s. Um, he was a really heroic guy in real life. Uh, he operated Coast Guard landing craft at the Battle of Tarawa in November 1943. And he essentially personally saved uh, 47 stranded Marines who were on the beach. Uh, and so he took his landing craft right into the thick of it. Uh, and he saved these guys. Um, and so, you know, we think of John Wayne as, as the big heroic guy, you know, in, in movies like this. Um, but, you know, World War II was won by people like Eddie Albert, who did not boast about it, did not often talk about it. They did their part. And then some of them ended up in, in movies uh, portraying the heroics of others. Uh, it's, it's an incredible full circle when you think about it. And then, of course, here at the very end, we have Norman Coda finding a, a fresh cigar in his jacket. He gets it out, lights it up, uh, signifying the battles yet to come, perhaps. And, uh, you know, you may not often watch end credits um, in a movie, but this is certainly one worth doing just that, because it really shows you the full breadth of talent, uh, international talent, uh, that, that was used in, in the production of this film. And as, 
as the movie posters of the time indicated, you know, it boasted something like 48 international stars of the stage and screen and so on and so forth. And uh, you can really uh, let that sink in as you watch uh, those names uh, scroll up up the screen as, as Paul Anka's title song uh, plays in the background. Uh, another interesting nugget that you'll notice at the very end of the movie um, is that it says, and John Wayne. And this was a special stipulation uh, that John Wayne demanded. Uh, Daryl F. Zanuck and John Wayne did not get along. And uh, Daryl Zanuck had been uh, critical of John Wayne's producing career. And uh, John Wayne ultimately got his payback with this movie. He was paid a quarter of a million dollars when most of the other big stars were paid $25,000. Um, and so uh, there too is another uh, rift and another point of contention that was involved in the production of this movie. The Longest Day, despite a lot of its creative liberties and, and shortcomings, uh, is really indicative of this classic era of epic filmmaking. And uh, despite some of its problems, uh, it really does a fine job of capturing the broad canvas that was the D-Day invasion. And it's so well acted and so well produced and executed in so many ways that in my mind it makes up for uh, a lot of the historical problems and fabrications uh, that are located throughout it. And uh, it, it certainly has a very different upbeat ending in contrast to Saving Private Ryan, which we will explore later on. If you're interested in learning more uh, about the Normandy invasion, you of course uh, can't go wrong with what this movie is based off of, uh, Cornelius Ryan's 1959 book, The Longest Day. And the really nice thing about this book is that Cornelius Ryan interviewed a lot of these individuals himself. And that is how he was able to get that first-hand perspective, balancing the big picture and the small picture simultaneously that we also see in the movie. I will also recommend my own book. I uh, will give that a plug as well. And that is entitled Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion. And uh, I spent two years researching this book. I combed through 150 different American newspapers to see how citizens and soldiers experienced June 6th, 1944. It's a very organic view of the invasion. Uh, predominantly filled with first-hand accounts that, by and large, haven't been read in over three-quarters of a century. If you are more of a visual learner, I would uh, very much recommend uh, this uh, hefty coffee table book by Martin Morgan, uh, which has some really great uh, photographs that are uh, rather rare and unique, but nonetheless uh, paint a very vivid portrait of Operation Overlord. So there you have it. Some additional homework for you until next time. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Real History. We'll see you next time.